Welcome to Chaotic Harmony. My name is John. This is Crystal. I'm Mark. I'm Zoe. We talk about the joys and the challenges of teaching music in the elementary school classroom. We share inspiration. We share struggles. We brainstorm solutions. We would love to have you join us. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Quarantined Chaos Episode 5. <sighs> Yay! Yay! And here we are. Here we are, we're trying to improve our audio this week. Just to let you know, it is something that we are actively working on to come back to the level of quality that you are used to, even though we can't all be together in the same room. Um, and we're excited sh- to we're excited to improve that. What's that? I'm sure you're all tired of hearing Zoom calls, so let's oh try to gosh. have a little bit more modified audio. That's our goal, at least. <laughs> Please, the Zoom fatigue is real. Uh, we're all sick of it. <laughs> but good things have come out of Zoom. Um, and an awesome thing that we got to do on Zoom this week was we got to share with the Pennsylvania Music Educator Association. Uh, we gave a workshop about um, all of us being uh, distance teachers right now, and we talked about our feelings, and we talked about mindfulness, and we talked about philosophy and how your teaching philosophy has to change a little bit uh, when you're teaching music from afar. And I I loved it. Um, what a great group of people and their willingness to share was really humbling and um, and I I just really loved being in community um, and getting to, to feel that from people all the way in Pennsylvania. Uh, what did you guys walk away from that experience with? We learned so well, much. <laughs> yes, we, we have. Mm-hmm. And I think one of the things that I got from it was that things that are our culture situation, like we take for granted. I think. Um, Do you mean like we in Chula Vista? I think or... Chula Vista also our report personally. Like it's, yeah. they talk about, you know, uh, social, like they talk about isolation this time. And like, I feel like it was just more prevalent when we interacted with a community that's thousands, hundreds or thousands, no thousands. I don't know how many miles away, but many, thousands. many and many miles away. Thousands, yeah. Thousands, yes. <laughs> yeah. I'm tired. I'm a, the U.S. I'm on is big and Pennsylvania is on the other side. Pennsylvania is not <laughs> L.A. True. <laughs> North versus, yeah. So, but yeah, no, seriously, like, um, to see and to interact with how they're wrestling with music education, it's like we're all in the same boat, but we're dealing with it from different perspectives. Mm-hmm. And to it was very eye opening to see how everyone just wrestles with it differently. Yeah, and it was great to hear from them. Um, and we're, uh, it was really good to talk to a group of other educators about um, how they were dealing with the, uh, the whole trauma side of what we're going through. And we really focused on the feeling of loss that we're all experiencing right now as music educators, the loss of our face-to-face classrooms. Um, and so something that I, someone that I'm really excited to introduce everybody to is my very good friend, Noelle Vitor, who just joined us on Zoom. Hi, Noelle. Hi, Noelle. Hi. 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 I had the pleasure of knowing Noelle for many years. Years um, now, my gosh. Years before either of us were parents. <laughs> um, yeah, she has two little boys too. Um, so Noelle, these are my people. Hi, it's so nice to meet all of you. Hello. Really, it's wonderful to be here. I just so much respect everything that all of you do. It's just amazing to um, hear your podcast and to know that you guys are making a change in so many people's lives. So happy to be here. Thank you. Thanks Thanks for listening to us. Yes, thank you for listening to us. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Noelle, we're, we've actually got the, um, the tape rolling already. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so can you tell, it, tell everyone like who you are and what you do? Wonderful. So my name is Noelle, and um, I'm a licensed clinical social worker, and I work as a psychotherapist. I work in mental health, and currently I am working with active duty service members in a um, drug and alcohol uh, rehabilitation facility. It's a residential treatment facility. Um, and like so many other Americans, I am currently working from home and have uh, two kids, like Crystal said. And so I'm navigating work and being a parent and, you know, all the rest of that good stuff. So here all we the are. Things. Yeah. All yeah. of the things. Yeah. All of the things. So I, um, I definitely reached out to Noel early in this whole thing because I was like, friend, I need to cope. <laughs> And I'm not coping entirely in a healthy way. 
And I was thinking about Noel too as we were getting ready to present to PMEA this week um, and just thinking about like what are some things that we can come at. So I was hoping to just get your perspective, Noel, for what to do with our feelings and how to acknowledge them and you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I can um, offer what I can to all of you, but I think that what you've been talking about on the podcast and just sort of where you all are at, um, and I think it really echoes where your audience is at, and so I think that you are all right on track, and really just acknowledging the feelings that you're all having, that's what I'll suggest to all of you as well, um, and anything that I can add, I hope that you can put into your toolbox or that your listeners can as well, but um, this is really about just acknowledging where you're at right now and um, finding community where you can. Um, but I thought that I'd start just by acknowledging for, for me that the world's stressed right now. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, you know, that yeah, this that's is, real. yeah, it is right. <laughs> and this is kind of, when we think about globally, um, it can be unifying that, you know, all of us are going through the same thing. And at the same time, everyone's going through a different situation. And there are some people who are facing um, unemployment or will be facing unemployment in a few months. There's others of us who don't know what our job will look like. Um, and there's others of us who just sort of are coping with um, all these sorts of different uh, stressors, right? So um, it, it's unifying, but at the same time, it still looks like stress. Mm -hmm. um, so what can we do as far as how to kind of address that stress? And I'm a big brain person. So mm -hmm. um, I thought that we'd start this conversation out by just doing a quick little snippet on what happens in the brain when we get stressed, if that's okay with all of you. Cool. Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so this is like a 30 second kind of overview. But um, so when we uh, feel any kind of stress, what's happening in the brain is there's this little tiny almond shaped kind of component in our brain. And it's right here in the center of our brain. So we can think about it sort of sitting right in the middle of everything. And any experience that we have um, is filtered through our, what's called our amygdala. And our amygdala is the fear center of our brain. So uh, all of us look pretty relaxed right now. And um, that's a good thing, right? Because we're not in any kind of danger right now, or at least I hope we're not. Um, <laughs> however, if a fire alarm went off in one of our homes, we probably all kind of look around to find if it was our home or kind of be looking at the screen to find whose home it, it is, right? And then we'd all sort of have a panic reaction. And that's our amygdala saying, alert, 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 something's wrong. Um, so when we have that alert go off, what happens is that uh, it starts with the amygdala and then it sort of goes through the circuitry in the brain. And if it's not a real, a real um, danger, it sits, uh, it moves to our uh, hippocampus. And our hippocampus is where the long-term memory is stored. And what's happening right now is that um, when, a, when a fear kind of hits our amygdala, and it happens in a second, and there is that threat, it sort of circumvents or surpasses that, um, uh, that pathway to the hippocampus. And so it re-loops and re-loops into the amygdala again and again. And so that's saying, yep, there still is a fear. Yep, there still is a fear until that fear kind of goes away. And how many weeks have we all been at home now? Oh my gosh, this is eight. Eight, eight <laughs> weeks, right? <laughs> Holy mackerel. Right. So, <laughs> so a lot of us are still kind of li living from the amygdala. And mm -hmm. that's what happens when we get stressed. We don't have time to kind of process um, through kind of what's happening and how it's related to past experiences in our life. And really that is in part because we haven't had an experience like this before. Yeah. The mm -hmm. oldest person alive has not had an experience like this before. So all of us have um, reason to be stressed, right? Mm -hmm. And how do we sort of calm that part of our brain down while we are kind of in this moment of stress? So I'll talk about that in a moment. But um, I also want to acknowledge that we are hopefully all um, in the midst of all this stress, also taking care of ourselves in whatever way, shape, and form that is. And all of us have to um, kind of separate ourselves from what's happening in the world at some point. 
And so maybe that looks like not talking about it or turning off the news once in a while. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but if we don't deal with it at some point, it's going to kind of get into our subconscious. And then um, our fears come out of our subconscious. And then it gets projected onto people that we love, live with, care about. Or sometimes it looks like yelling at the TV, right? Does that make mm -hmm. sense? Yep. Or a Facebook post. <laughs> or a really Facebook is. post, right? <laughs> um, yeah, an angry yeah. Twitter, right? Sure. Um, and boy, once those are out there, once you press submit, it's, it's out there, right? It's not coming back. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one of the ways that our fears um, is manifested, right? It's important that we distance ourselves or what we call like cognitive dissonance. It's important that we separate ourselves, but also important that we acknowledge. Another way that we can... Um, uh, unhealthily kind of deal with our emotions is called emotional reasoning. Meaning this is when we say, I feel scared and therefore there must be a danger. Mm -hmm. And when we think about um, what danger there is in the world, we can kind of name one or a few, right? Um, but it's the possibility versus the probability. And so although our feelings might say, I'm scared, I feel anxious, I feel worried, um, what's the what's the possibility and the probability of something actually occurring and what can we do about that right here and right now? Can we repeat that that last bit like right before you were talking about possibility versus probability you were saying like I feel scared because can you talk about that again? Yeah, absolutely. So many of us it's a it's a cognitive distortion is what we call it and it's emotional reasoning and that's because our emotions are so powerful and are so smart. So when something happens to us, we have an emotion about it. That's just the way that we are built, right? And so if I feel happy about something, oh, there must be something in my life that's making me happy, right? And in the same way, if I feel fear about something, if I feel scared about something, there must be something in my life that is making me feel this way. And that's the way that our brain just sort of is, that's the way we make sense of the world, right? And it doesn't always, those two things don't always connect, right? It's, it's not, not always true. true. It's not always yeah. true, right? And mm -hmm. so much of kind of what's happening in the world and we watch sort of these, or I'll say for me, sometimes I've seen these stories on the news, right? That are just heartbreaking and mm -hmm. they affect me emotionally. But does that mean that there's something wrong for me? No, I can have compassion for that person without thinking that there's a danger, right? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It does. Um, and I've been, two things kind of stood out to me when you were talking. Um, the first is I keep thinking about how, I keep thinking about how scared everybody is. And when I, when I bring myself back to that place, um, then I have a lot more compassion for everybody because it's really easy to look at the actions of somebody. Um, maybe, you know, somebody says something on social media that I don't agree with, or I like come across a, a neighbor, um, you know, not practicing adequate social distancing or whatever, you know, <laughs> and I have that fear Why? reaction. <laughs> I have, <laughs> I have that reaction within myself of like, oh, they're, you know, I, I think very, not compassionate thoughts. Um, but then I remember, oh, we're all acting out of fear right now. And when I reframe that from like, oh, they're dumb to they're scared, it's just, it's, yeah, it's a much more um, compassionate response. Um, and and then the other thing that I was thinking about was um, just your, your way that um, you frame it where we need to shut off the things that are not helpful right now. Um, and we, we actually shared that with a group of educators this last week that, um, you know, taking kind of a social media break or a news break um, or just greatly filtering um, can be so important right now. Like instead of the steady stream of things that make you go uh, all day long um, and pierce your heart, like maybe it's time to silence a couple of those uh, Marco Polo threads and, you know, stay off Facebook and get your news once a day from a source that you trust. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And in addition to that, Crystal, I would even say kind of um, to develop a list or, you know, write it down or even in your mind of trigger words. Or sometimes mm -hmm. I turn on the news and there's like kind of a voice that 
kind of triggers me into fear, it's okay to turn off the news if I hear that voice, right? Um, uh, for me, pandemic really kind of invites a fear into me. Um, mm -hmm. Unprecedented really kind of changes the way that I'm feeling in a day, right? Mm -hmm. And so being aware of that, and if I hear those news, if I hear kind of stories with those words in it, kind of clicking out of that, right? I can always go to the CDC website or another kind of, you know, website that's trust, you know, that, that I trust and can, you know, get that information without those words, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, just allowing yourself, giving yourself permission, I think is so important in the middle of all this, Crystal. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that really brings me to a good point, Crystal and Zoe, about kind of what can we do and this is where all of you are experts. Um, and I have um, a workbook that's actually free. It got sent to me um, by the, I'm going to get this wrong, but I believe it's by the uh, Wellness Coalition. And it's a free workbook, um, and it has lots of activities that you can do. I can give it to you guys so you can put it up on yes. the show notes. Um, yeah. And it also has other, other um, resources if you, you know, want that as well. Um, but this is really a time that you can get to know yourself. Um, and so, you know, this is sort of a way that you can cope. Um, but one of the things that I, I would say is to really just embrace that this sucks. <laughs> that this time <laughs> this sucks. Um, and, uh, you know, if you need an invitation to, to do that, here's your invitation. But, um, you know, we can... Lean we can into the suck. suck. Exactly, right. Like... You know, all of us can pretend like it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. And many of us, I know that you all had students um, that you were involved in their lives more so than maybe you are now um, a couple of months ago. But, you know, it's okay to accept for yourself, even inside yourself, that this sucks. Um, and a way to do that is through something that we call radical acceptance, right? Mm -hmm. To acknowledge that which we cannot change. And to say, not to say everything's okay, but to say it's happening right now. And that is a gift that you can give yourself um, in itself, right? Um, and then the other thing that, that really helps for a lot of people is to make a worry list. Mm -hmm. And if you're the type of person who has panic attacks or frequently has like anxiety attacks, that's not for you to write down all of your concerns, right? Because it can feel overwhelming. But if you're the type of person who connects, especially those who are creative, oftentimes find that writing their worries down is very helpful. Um, and so just making a list of, you know, this is what scares me. This is what worries me today. Um, and make that list as long and as thorough as you can. And then um, fold it up and put it somewhere where you work. I would suggest not putting it like in your bedside table or you know, um, on your kitchen table where you eat food, but somewhere, you know, if you have a desk at home that you do work, put that in there, or you can, um, you know, put it in your wallet where you can get it out when you want to, but knowing that it's in some place that's, that's sort of far apart from you sometimes helps. Um, and then the other thing that I would say is to engage in active rests. So um, I think that all of us, may, maybe most of us, um, know a lot more about um, wild animals and big cats than we did at the beginning of this whole time with, um, you know, the Tiger King uh, uh, connection, right? But um, all of us are, uh, or most of us are kind of binging on Netflix or wearing pajama pants around the house, which is totally okay, but also to engage in um, like activities to go outside and to have a, a rest um, by moving around is really important. So those, those are really the ways that I've thought of that you can, um, you know, that, that we can all kind of help ourselves through all of this. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I think, I don't know actually how all of you are reaching your students. I know that you all have to be creative in the ways you're doing that. But if there's any capacity for you to um, reach out to students who, you know, may be hurting financially or who are not in the best sort of living situation, um, you know, an email or a note or a, some other kind of, um, you know, social media connection, um, anything you can do to just tell somebody that you're thinking of them um, obviously goes a long way. Yeah. Yeah. 
I'm not sure what happened to Crystal. We lost Crystal. Yeah, she, she didn't like us. us. <laughs> like, I had done this conversation, so I done and done and done done her. <laughs> I have so many questions, and oh. I don't know if like Mark and John, you wanna if you had something you well, wanna. I, I can ask you later. Get at it. <laughs> well, I'll talk from like my own point of view. So something that I've noticed is that when I am feeling like sad, and this is like. I, I've been noticing this in the last couple of weeks, like something will happen and I find out some sort of news. And then at the moment, I'm like, yeah, that's that's sad, but I'm OK. Kind of like what you're saying. But then it's hours later where I'm like, I just can't move past it. Hi, Crystal. You're back. I'm sorry. <laughs> <It's okay. laughs> I dove into questions because I have like all these questions and I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, our coworker at my school, a really well-liked guy, was on, uh, he was in a Navy Reserve, and he got news that he would be deployed, and this was months ago. And we were all just kind of like, we don't, you know, like, we just don't want the day to come when you have to go. And it ended up being uh, his last day working for the school ended up being during this quarantine. And our principal told us in a, like, in an online meeting, like, yes, this is his last day, and, uh, like, just circumstances are that he won't be able to return to our school when he comes back. And we were crushed, but, like, the way that we're able to express it was just, like, in a chat, like, no, like, so sad. And I, was, and I had been preparing for this. I had, like, still been talking to, to my coworker, but it was, like, that happened. And then for the rest of the day and for, like, days later, I was, like, I'm just so sad about this. And I'm, it almost feels like a like an echo chamber it's mm -hmm. like if i remember a little bit of it the then i'm just like oh yeah it's big again yeah. so i'm just wondering like yeah like if you is there something like to do with the brain or like yeah so one of the things might be to write that down and to put it somewhere for a couple of days and then to come back to it and see yeah. if that kind of that um separation helps you yeah but also and i think that this is true kind of for a lot of people right now is everything was sort of so abrupt obviously that's a, a significant kind of situation but as everything was so abrupt as we kind of closed down the schools immediately right. um but another thing that i really invite a lot of people who are going through that sort of um uh sadness to do is to do some meditation um i think this is actually in the workbook that i'll give you but um there's a safe space meditation that you can do and it invites you to um, just uh, think about a place whether it's real or imagined that you can feel peace it's usually yeah. by yourself um, and you know it elicits sort of feelings um, from within you how you're feeling in the moment and so when you are feeling sort of out of control or feeling like you're going down sort of the spiral right right it brings you back to center and really allows you to be calm but also, you know, Zoe, it makes sense, right? It, all of those feelings make sense. So again, to acknowledge those feelings, I speak about feelings as if they're people um, mm -hmm. that need to be acknowledged, that need to be respected. And so, you know, instead of kind of feeling overwhelmed and saying, Ugh, I can't deal with you, to say, yeah, this is really difficult for me right now, dealing mm -hmm. with this particular emotion, because I really felt this particular way about a coworker. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. That's I can't wait for this workbook. I'm so excited. <laughs> I know. Oh, oh, I've never yeah. thought about talking about my feelings like they're people. I really like that. Yeah. I, when I'm working with health coaching clients, we talk about, I, I sometimes suggest that they talk about their body as, a, as if the body is kind of a separate entity because people really shame themselves. Um, and I'm really seeing a lot of that right now, like with all the food choices people are making to deal with their feelings in quarantine. Right. And right. I'm like, well, what if we, what if we talk about your body? Like she's worth taking care of, or he's worth taking care of, you know, instead of, you know, something shameful, that's embarrassing. Like this is your home and this is, you know, someone that we care about. And 
sometimes people find that helpful. So I, I like that. And that's interesting. The other thing I was thinking about, I don't know if you've heard of anxiety box. Have you heard of that? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Have, it's yeah. like a, a bot website where you can go sign up. I don't know if it's still around. It's been around for a long time and you can like put your anxiety in it and then it'll spam you with your own anxious thoughts all day. And the idea is that you like turn your anxiety into an annoying bot that just bugs you to where you just delete it all day until you're like, this is ridiculous. Right. Right. I don't know. I found that helpful and kind of funny. <laughs> yeah. So that's a, um, uh, easy hold to kind of like, you know, you can fall into that, um, Google search and there's all <laughs> sorts of different resources like that. Mm -hmm. that um, kind of help you to distance yourself from your thoughts because our thoughts can be, um, you know, they're part of who we are. So to bring them out like that is really helpful for a lot of people. Going back whenever we do, whether it's sooner or later, um, there will be a time where the kids have to process this and we have to process this. Do you have thoughts or tips on how we can help guide kids through that? Uh, yeah, well, um the only thing that I can say is to sit with kids' emotions. And I think particularly um, being teachers and being music teachers, music elicits so much emotion out of kids. And um, so, you know, there's going to be children who may not even be traumatized but don't know, have the words to um, express how they're feeling. And so to introduce sort of music in a way that um, that they can't express that might be really helpful. But, um, you know, I think that going into those situations, being feeling confident in yourself that you can do that, and then just allowing them to, to express themselves. Um, because that is the, I think, the greatest gift that we can give a child, and to really validate those feelings for, for kids. Yeah. That there are so many ways we can express ourselves through through words, but also through um, making music, through dance, right, um, through art. And so I really, that would be the way that I would encourage you there. Yeah, I really think that we are going to be doing, I, I believe we're, we do healing work in normal times, but that music is going to be more important than ever so important. Um, when we go back just to kind of help reestablish that sense of safety and security and unity when it is time to go back to school and then do would you have it's kind of a follow-up because my fear is that we go back and administrators and district officials and like some classroom teachers will will see how quote-unquote far behind kids are and that they'll just constantly push with the academics like super fast and just a lot all at once is there anything in like Granted, we don't like our our voices at our schools are they vary on how influential. But anything that you can share with us that we might be able to kind of talk with colleagues about, like yes, it's important that like they catch up on their academia, but it's still important that they have time to process and like like just I guess going back, it'll be a challenge to to balance those two because it is a constant balance. But is there anything that you think that like we could share with colleagues in sharing the importance of it? Ah, um, that's a great question. And I know that there are so many kind of um, so much research out there to support the idea that music and you all know this better than I do, but music um, is connected to increased sort of um, academic performance. Um, and so I would, I don't know about your colleagues, um, but, you know, in my world, people really like research, um, especially maybe administrators in your work. Um, and so to really be prepared for that and maybe go in with some research before they ask for it. But, you know, it's, I think that all of you deal with this and have been dealing with it um, is creating kind of a voice and a culture for the arts in all of your schools. And um, that's been something that you've been doing for, for a long time, I think. I remember when I was a kid, um, I remember my music teachers, but also I remember like how much we had to fight for, for music in our schools. And so, um, yeah, that would be what I suggest just continuing that conversation and where you can just 
advocating for yourself um, in those spaces because I'm going to start crying like I always do whenever I'm talking to Crystal about this stuff. But it is, <laughs> it is the utmost, it's so important, the work that all of you do. And, um, you know, to, to fight for that voice um, is so important. So I don't know if that helped, but I think, you know, just continue to fight the good fight like all of you are already doing. Um, so important. Yeah. I think um, your role as a parent with children in school is absolutely vital um, to, you know, what, what it looks like at normal times, but yeah, especially, especially when we go back. And yeah, you're right. We're going to have to know our research and we're going to have to know uh, music is important for music's sake. And I am 100% yeah. preaching to the choir on this podcast, um, literally with that, the quarantined choir. Um, <laughs> but, but, um, yeah, I think just uh, helping to arm our parents with the, with that knowledge that yes, your children will go further faster if they also receive a simultaneous music education. Yeah, and and I yeah, bringing it back to brain research and there's so much with music and healing and absolutely yeah from a trauma standpoint and from a learning standpoint. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much, huh? Oh. I was just going to yeah. say, John, you've been quiet. How are you feeling? There's just a lot of thoughts in my head. That's all. I, I guess for me that I, it's hard for, I want to put the precursor on this and that like, I find that taking care of the self is very important. I definitely value that. In the same sense, my fear is that as we focus on the self, that bigger powers that be will take advantage of our focus inward and will still plow through. And that when we return, mm -hmm things will be the same. Uh, our, the, the value of the arts will be the same, if not worse, because of funding. And I, I, I guess I, I haven't spoken because I don't have words. Uh, I don't have any questions. I just, I don't know what to do with it all. But um, yeah, that's where I'm at, I guess. There's a lot of that fear right now. Absolutely, yeah. And can it be done simultaneously? Um, you know, all of us adults, right, kind of have to navigate different parts of our lives. So can we take care of ourselves and fight for, you know, uh, you know, what we believe in and take care of the people around us who the people in our circle we need to take care of? Um, and yes, it will be difficult. And that's why Zoom meetings are so important and sort of all of these things as well, right? It's no easy answer, so. Yeah. Yeah. I have one more question, and I don't know if this is a completely different topic, but I'm so curious, what makes kids so resilient? <laughs> like, I, so I was telling uh, John, Mark, and Crystal before you hopped on the call that I found video footage from myself teaching seven years ago. It was my first uh, teaching gig at a summer school, and all my students were refugees. And I remember thinking, like what Mark said, like how can I how can I step into a classroom and I know there's been so much trauma, and I had no idea. I had never taught before, so I just and but now you know I know I I did it. I don't really know what I taught, but I I did that. And but what I when I was watching the video, I was like, these kids were incredible. They were smiling. They were eager to learn. And how like how is that possible? Well, Zoe, it sounds like you should go back to um, your, uh, your early teaching um, and just forget about everything you've learned and just kind of teach from, <laughs> from where you're at, um, where you were at seven years ago. Yeah. Um, mm. There's lots of different research to uh, talk about resilience, but the, um, I find the most fascinating um, to be um, what's called post-traumatic growth, and that um, a body of research that suggests that the more trauma that a child has been through, um, the more the opportunity they have to grow. And um, also in that body of research, it discusses, as it does in other um, research literature, that, um, you know, obviously the community around that child is important. Um, and <clears throat> the ability to... Um, to discuss things is important, right? But even children who don't have that, those resources, 
there is just something innate in us. Um, and as children, the way that we process things is based on what is told to us and what is not told to us. So even that honesty um, component, you know, talking to a child about the situation in an honest way, talking to a child about how parents are scared, but also, you know, why parents are not, why parents feel like they're going to get through this, right? All of that is really important in developing resilience. And so, you know, to go back to Mark's question, um, sitting with a child and really processing through that can build resilience in itself. There's um, resilience, though, is a beautiful thing to look at, and it's linked to kind of further motivation later on in life um, and quality of life as well. It's a fascinating, fascinating um, body of research. That is fascinating. I want to go down that route hole. The more yes, trauma, the more trauma a child has had, the more opportunity for growth they have. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's, that's incredible. So cool. Post traumatic growth. Yeah, even um, growth. even in adults. So, you know, mm -hmm. adults who have been through um, experiences that stay with them for years and years later, um, that, that too can, um, can result in, um, you know, greater understanding of ourselves. And mm -hmm. you don't get over that trauma, right? But to process right. through it and to change the way that you think about it and look at it so it doesn't haunt you anymore. Um, so you're thinking about it in a respectful way. Um, it's fascinating. fascinating. Oh, that's deep. It's funny. Uh, unfortunately, my, my sound was muted because of the program, so I missed part of that. But I really liked the, the last bit because I feel like from an objective standpoint, it's easy for us to say, oh, yeah, of course, that makes sense. If you've suffered, then you can learn from grow off of that. But like how often, like when we are in the moment, do we forget and we assist, succumb to the trauma if we don't? Yeah, it's fascinating. Yeah. That's all. It's fascinating. It is. Yeah. Mm. Wow. It, that gives me a lot of hope for when we go back. <laughs> Thank you, Noel. Thank you all thank again. You. Okay. It's just such a pleasure to talk with all of you, and thank you all so much for what you do. <clears throat> it's so important the work that you do. It's for like today's kids and for society twenty years from now. So I just well, um, and yours is yes. too. Yes, yours is so yes. important. Yeah, yes. absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Thank. I'm so grateful for you, and thank you for helping all of us go inward a little more deeply. Absolutely. Right Thank so. you. Okay. Be well. Be well. Bye. Okay. Bye. 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 Isn't she the best? That's, you know, we get <laughs> in this, like, we focus so much on arts and education that, like, we forget that the other subjects around us really help us. Subjects, I think, very educationally might, might be. But yeah, the other disciplines, <laughs> like, just help bolster and help, can help us a lot. And it's important for us to think outside the Music educational box. Mm -hmm. I love yeah. her. <laughs> oh, yeah. I love her, too, very much. Um, yeah, we connected pretty much immediately. We ended up sitting next to each other um, at a thing one time, and we've been best friends <laughs> ever since. Just like, Aww. yeah, come here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so I have... I. I have such mixed feelings about what next year holds, and I've been thinking about it ever since we got done with um, our PMEA workshop and what learning's going to look like, and I've been thinking about it since yesterday when we were on the latest music teacher meeting for the district. Um, but I do think that, I mean, we know that we are important, that we're important to our school community, that we're important to a child's whole development. We know the reasons why, but I've been thinking so much about how do we communicate that importance um, when we go back. And I was on the Save the Music call yesterday, and we had Marcia Neal from um, Nevada, who's a music ed consultant and an advocate, and she had such a great line. She was like, um, "Any," she said, any opportunity you can have right now and you need to be proactive about it, you need to be on the panels of people who are making the decisions for how education goes forward. Because if you're not sitting at the table, you're on the menu. And I was like, whoo, <laughs> that's good. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah and she's she's right. So I, I do, it's, we've always had to have our elevator speeches and we've written about that before. Um, and we've talked about that before and we've always had to advocate for ourselves. But, you know, continuing to talk through the lens of socio-emotional learning and through you know trauma healing and through enhancing 
other academic subjects and helping you know grow brains through music development I think is our way forward yes yeah and we know we can do that oh we can Mm -hmm. and I I was really glad, John, when during the uh, music teacher meeting yesterday that you pushed back when I brought up the virtual ensembles. I was hoping you would, but um, I didn't know if you would, because I think that's where we're going to get, that's where we're going to have our best argument is when we can create with students and, you know, they are the ones that are being featured. That's how we're going to... I mean, we've been, we've been saying this and trying to do this for years now, but it, yeah. It was funny because I had a conversation with a, a former student because I'm having this special project for former students and whatnot on a big collaboration. Uh, but anywho, like, uh, he was just talking about how it's ironic that all his teachers told him he shouldn't make videos, and yet all the teachers have to make videos now. Here we are. <laughs> you know? But like, it, and that happened before that meeting, Not right before, but it was the night before. And he was like, "What?" I was just really a baffled that like teachers would say that because, well, first off, like I get the concern about like that people think, "Oh, I can make a quick, quick buck off YouTube," and like trying to you know be realistic to the students is important. Um, but to say don't do it is like it hinders so much growth like i learned so much in high school with the stu- like, stupidest stuff of just hobbyist mentality just trying things out um and i never knew what it would amount to and so bringing it back to the conversation here where i think there's a lot of apprehension the teachers saying don't try this it's not worth your time it can be or it can, they're coming it from can, that amygdala that fear yeah of I am replaceable. The tiny almonds inside your brain. <laughs> like, I, I get that. I totally do. And I think there's, in, but there's a weird balance. Some people are definitely reacting out of fear. Mm-hmm. Um, I think there's also some people being realistic. Cause I've always said in the very beginning of every single time people have asked me about virtual concerts to say, it's a lot of work. Mm-hmm. It's a lot of work, but it's doable. Mm-hmm. And, I think even if you fail and making the vision that you want to create, um, you still learn something out of it and you still gather something. So I think for all educators, even if it doesn't turn out the way you want it to turn out, even if it's not, even if you dream that there's like a perfect Zoom call where you can do a live concert, like it's not going to happen, but you can learn stuff from it. And if it's not going to go viral, the, the point is to give the kids a chance to collaborate and to feature the kids. And to let them know that their voices are still important in whatever means we have available to us. And it's not about being an incredible virtual teacher. It's about being enough for the kids that you are given within the set of circumstances that you find yourself. And always. And also just like that all said, that was great, like really important stuff. But on top of that, like experiment, as we ask our kids to experiment, we should experiment too. Growth is uncomfortable. I don't know about you guys, but that blew my mind when she said that the research backs up that the more trauma a person has had, the greater their capacity for growth. Because I think we hear messaging to the opposite so much when we talk about trauma like it's um, an unhealable wound, you know? Um, yeah, wow. I think about a lot of, like, a lot of parents, and it's not supposed to point towards anyone, but, like, this happens to everyone. Like, a lot of parents try to withhold pain from their kids. Mm-hmm. and we learn from it. Like, if a kid falls, or if a kid touches a, touches a stove, they're going to learn not to touch that stove again. And I think the same thing happens with something bigger, like trauma, yeah. Good talk, yeah. you guys. But yeah. I, think, I, I still think more good stuff can happen. Um, yes. If, because we're, like, it was great involving, um, involving Noel in this conversation, but we could also expand further if uh, we have our community grow wider. So that's why... Guys, if you could, it would be extremely helpful to make this community grow if you go to your podcast app and iTunes or wherever you go, Stitcher, etc. Leave us a review. It's super important so that we can grow this community and have more guests, have more people, keep these lights running, both figuratively and literally. Um, and also, guys, uh, if you have any questions, we would love to hear uh, your thoughts. Uh, you can always email us at chaoticharmony at, chaoticharmony at gmail.com.
And speaking of growing our community, we have an opportunity for all of you listeners. We would like to invite you into a space to have a live conversation with us. Um, so just as we had the great pleasure of presenting to PMEA this last week, we would like to give you a chance to come into a space where we can talk about taking good care of ourselves while we navigate this growth curve that we are on with distance learning. So we invite you to attend our first live Chaotic Harmony workshop, uh, which will be on Wednesday, May 20th from 4 to 5 um, p.m. Pacific uh, time. Um, and it's going to be absolutely free, but we're going to talk to you about some of the things that we are learning and that we are sitting with, and we want to hear your experience. So we, uh, we will be putting that information out on our social media channels and in the description of this episode, and we really hope that you can join us for that. We would love to have you. Yeah. Good. All right, so we are back with a spiccato after a quick break. I want to take a quick break and thank my husband, Brian, who's been working behind the scenes producing these episodes every week on all of the platforms and on time. But you need to know that he is first a financial planner for Mission Trails Financial. Mission Trails Financial is a partner that seeks to guide clients in the journey to financial success. They believe that people need a financial advisor that aims to provide strategies for success. Mission Trails Financial helps people navigate investments, tax planning, and insurance. Imagine working with an advisor who isn't tied to specific brands. Mission Trails Financial has a fiduciary responsibility to act in the best interests of their clients by providing independent, objective advice. Their mission is to help clients accomplish their financial goals. As Joe Vitale once said, a goal should scare you a little and excite you a lot. Do yourself a favor and set up a time to chat with Mission Trails Financial. Visit www.missiontrailsfinancial.com or call 619-419-0238 to schedule a call. You'll be glad you did. We believe that leaning on professionals is how we get ahead. Check out the program notes for more information. Who brought our spiccato? I have a spiccato. Giant bubble wand. Ooh. So not oh, small so bubbles, so it, like specifically <laughs> giant bubbles. Giant bubbles. Mm-hmm. We've been playing a lot with bubbles Ooh. with Jem. How fun. What so, would you do with giant bubbles? I mean, my first, sorry, Crystal, go. Right, you start it. But the green box one, you first. So you might as well just keep going with it. I'm so sorry, sorry what would you do with this? issues on my end. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, the first thing, the obvious first thing was Le bon movement. Obviously. Obviously. Obviously, yeah. But I mean, no, seriously, like, like we talk, we try not to talk about, as you teach dance, you try not to talk about float like a bubble because mm-hmm. then the mindset goes towards bubbles. But if you just show it and just have music play and interact with it, I think Josh Block would be proud of me, that's all. We play a game in music class with three partners, one who has a symbol, finger symbols, and someone blowing bubbles and someone popping bubbles. Mm -hmm. And um, the finger symbol has to crash at the same time the person pops the bubbles. Oh, so fun. We should try that on Zoom. (gasps) That'd be fun. That actually would be fun. It wouldn't work. No, I think it would. It would work in a video though, like, (laughs) Yes. Obviously, like the lag issues, but I still think for I might actually try something like that with kindergarten when we're on our when we're on our video call. I think they'd have a ball with it, like clap when I pop the bubble. I think they'd love that. On a tangent, I'm sorry. I saw this video of Jacob Collier and also Chris Martin from Coldplay trying to do a duet online. It was hilarious, mm-hmm. and they they <laughs> both knew it was they both knew what's going on. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's just drive home that this does not happen, people. Even to two professional musicians. No, it doesn't happen. Okay, so we've got Laban. We've got bubble conducting. I I have a very similar wand, but in yellow. And I have used it in the past to cheer on people who are running. Because I used to live on a race route. Like the <laughs> San Diego cool. Turkey Trot or whatever. I used to go past my apartment. I don't live there anymore, but I have been looking into doing a virtual 5K. And I might just have to bring some bubbles with me. That'd be fun. Excellent. And Mark, I'm sure you've had many fun afternoons with Gemma. Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, Use it for a bubble dance. And so what I mean by that is 
Um, with the bigger wands, it's easier to get bubbles by not using your air to make them, but by gliding through the air with it. So what you do is you glide, you create your bubbles, and then you need to try to interact with the bubbles that you've created. And so you are interacting and trying to create more bubbles, maybe around a bubble, and just have that interaction with it. And then you can expand it where you have a partner and you interact with what they've created and what you've created. So you're kind of like, you're creating this bubble, and then if I was to do that, say, Crystal, you had a wand, then you would kind of like create around that bubble, and then I would create around one that you made, and then it can even expand further. That would be really fun. That's so cool. Fun. Old ants. Gosh. You guys are first in person or workshop when we're together, then it's going to be so good. Mm. <laughs> I miss it. Oh, that was good. I like it. Um, and did we decide, who did we decide to do in quarantine song of the week? Zozo. Zoe. Zoe, what song are we going to put in for you this week? This week, we're going to hear Here I Sit and Wait for You. one for us because this was our intro to Orf. Oh, that's right! The day! The very, it's the very first <laughs> yeah. thing. I was so... It was weird. I, Shout I, I out to Dave. Yeah, Shout out to Dave back to <laughs> Who did? Why, why can't I stay in my seat? Yeah, seriously. No, it was like, it comes up, doesn't say a word, pulls out a recorder around his neck, just plays a note, starts singing. With no so shoes. He's sitting, Are we all... Sitting crisscross on the ground halfway across the room from us while we're all in our seats, ready to take notes for our Pencils professional and our, development. Yeah. Gosh. And he sings and just does this and invites us, all, beckons us all into the circle. And we were like, what's happening? And then we were like, okay. <laughs> Why is this man with a beard, shorts, and no shoes on summoning me? <laughs> You know the joke with the uh, with the uh, teachers that all teach together, like with Dave um, for levels, is uh, get in the van. We have candy. <laughs> <laughs> we got in the van. We got in the orc van. Just for uh, just for legal purposes, van. Chaotic Harmony does not approve of you getting into a stranger's van with candy. <laughs> <laughs> Only if Dave's driving. Um, Just for legal purposes, we do not. <laughs> <laughs> you guys, thanks for listening another week. We appreciate yeah. you. Um, we really, truly hope that you join us on May 20th for our workshop. We would absolutely be thrilled to see you there. Um, and if they and have any questions about yes. that, Crystal, where can they reach you specifically? Well, they can reach me um, on Twitter at Finny Vapa. You can find me at my website, crystalpridmore.com. And Zoe? You can find me on Twitter uh, at Miss Kumagai or on what are they called? YouTube? On YouTube at Rose Bank Panther Music. <laughs> and you can find me on Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube all under Mr. Kimer. Yes. You can find me at Mr. Seligman, M R S E L I G M A N, on Instagram or Twitter or now YouTube. Well, I'm sorry. For the sake of trying to make a nice segue, I cut you off, Crystal. 
Oh, it's so fun. It's yeah. fine. You can find <coughs> all of us at chaoticharmonyclassroom.com or you can email us at chaoticharmonyclassroom at gmail. And also reach us on the different social medias at CH Classroom, except for YouTube because they don't like us. So Chaotic Harmony Classroom <laughs> via YouTube. We're working on it. Yep. We'll Have out. a wonderful week, you guys. We'll be in touch. Okay. See you okay. later. Bye. Bye. The Chaotic Harmony Podcast is a joint project between Crystal Pridmore, Jonathan Seligman, Zoe Kumagai, and Mark Kemer. You can find us online at chaoticharmonyclassroom.com. You can email us at chaoticharmonyclassroom at gmail and let us know what you think. Give us feedback about what you would like to hear in future episodes. We're on all the socials. Find us on facebook.com slash chaoticharmonyclassroom. You can find us on Twitter at chclassroom, Instagram at chaoticharmonyclassroom, and you can even find our episodes on YouTube. Chaotic Harmony is the name of our channel. Special thanks to Brian Pridmore for his help with production and equipment. www.pridmoria.com Mark, Fine. I will tickle you from afar. Oh, I'm peeking. Okay, I should stop doing that. Now you're not doing anything. <laughs> <laughs> oh, My microphone's still being picked this up. This is though. what happens when we give Mark hosting <laughs> hours. I mean, if someone else wants to pay for Zoom, you can host. Am I still really low in the screen? Should oh. I stand? I mean, you're relatively low, but you're fine. That's too, let's, that doesn't work. Let's not do that, Zoe. <laughs> yeah. Go Sit get on your, a phone book. <laughs> your biggest book that you have. I do have a very large book. <laughs> We're gonna do it. Testing. Okay. Well, that's perfect. Okay. Hey. That looks like a phone book. What was that? Uh, it's it's a jazz recording anthology. Good uh, yeah. night. <laughs>